Watching Soren Hermansen play an audience is like watching a virtuoso play a violin. He's famous as an energy magician, but in fact he's a community magician, a conjurer of human motivation and desire. It's true that he led the Danish island of Samsø to become 100% energy independent using renewable resources. More than that, in fact, because the island of 4,000 people now exports 10% of the energy it produces. Nothing magical or particularly novel about the technology. Things like big wind turbines, some of them offshore, fields of solar panels, district heating, where one big shared boiler uses biofuel to heat many individual houses. But in Samsø, these things belong not to some big distant corporation, but to the islanders themselves, to local co-ops, to local entrepreneurs, to the municipal government of Samsø. And it's funny, Soren says, but if a wind turbine belongs to you and is paying you dividends, it doesn't look ugly. Wind turbines that you own don't make nasty noises, they make nice noises, like ka-ching in the cash register. And that's the magic. That's the magic. It's not the turbines. It's the way that people feel about them. It's the way that local communities have been led to take ownership of their own future. And that's a result of skillful organizing, ruthlessly realistic analysis, and deep understanding of local sensitivities. Soren Hermansen is a native of Samsø, which is why he understands it so deeply. But he's also smart enough to stand a little aside and analyze how his community ticks. He's the absolute embodiment of think globally, act locally. He's been profiled in The New Yorker, and he's won the Gothenburg Prize, the environmental equivalent of the Nobel Prize. At present, he's the director of the Samso Energy Academy, the Samso Energy Academy. The mission of the Academy is to move from best practice to next practice by sharing with the rest of the world what its people have learned about living sustainably and doing that together. Let's start by, by the challenge to become the energy island. So the government of Denmark decided it was going to choose one of several islands to become the energy island. What was that challenge and how did Samso get to the, the, the island chosen? Well, I th it started quite a lot earlier than that. It started with the 70s oil crisis, where we actually had a lot of discussions in Denmark. What, what would be the next fuel for, for Denmark? Because we like to think of, our, of ourselves as non-self-supplied non with, with, uh, with energy. So in that period, we had a lot of things going on with renewable energy. Those were the first wind turbine manufacturers. They actually started to get off the ground. We had the first real big wind project also, um, one of the alternative schools, like it's called the Twin Schools. Uh, they experimented with a big megawatt wind turbine, which was the, the one of the kind. And they had a lot of volunteers, engineers and practitioners. They came out there, so this kind of hippie school to, to try to make this turbine work. And it, they, they, they got it, they, they, they put it up and they, it, it was in operation. Uh, and it, it, they proved they could make a megawatt wind turbine at that time. It's still there as kind of a symbol of the time when, they, when, when engineering and, 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 and creativity kind of met and, and kind of paved the way for a greener, a greener energy supply. And the oil crisis also taught us that uh, oil was kind of not there forever. And we, we need to kind of administrate the resources we have. Out of that period, grew the Minister of Environment, Mr. Sven Augen, who in the 90s was a very powerful minister. He actually merged the Ministry of Traffic and Infrastructure, the Ministry of, of, um, of Climate and Energy, and the Ministry of, uh, of Resources in one big super ministry. It was by, la by, by far the largest ministry in, in, in the whole uh, government. And a very, I mean, at atypical. It was not like we usually did in Denmark. So he was a very powerful, he's more powerful than the prime minister, more or less. So he went to Kyoto very confident um, in, in 96 at the Kyoto COP3 meeting and told the world that uh, Denmark would cut down 21% of the CO2 emission, uh, which was not really kind of agreed on in Denmark, but he said it out loud. <laughs> and he was followed by the Swedes and the Germans, which he already talked to also said, that we'll go home and, and, and make this work also in Sweden and, and Germany. So these three nations, they actually kind of led to a binding contract at the, at the Kyoto conference, which was maybe one of the only top meetings or COP meetings where they actually signed the contract, which they never really did since. So when he came home, he more or less promised to do something about, about climate and energy. So he sent out this competition to prove that it was possible to do it. And he said in, 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 in the competition that we, we'd like to have a community that is most likely an island because you can measure everything in and out. It, it's easy to monitor what is happening here. 
and we can oversee it quickly. It'll be a model for, for, for Denmark, for Europe, for the world. And in the competition, it was said that we need to have it as kind of a, uh, a model for technology development, not rocket science, but, but uh, proven technology that's already out there working, but in a scaled uh, model, uh, kind of a societal model uh, of development. We want to do it with today's policy and legal structures and subsidy models also. Not, the, the winner is not achieving a lot of money from, um, from, from the government, but they have to do it on the same conditions as anybody else in, in Denmark would do. Otherwise, it'll not be a good model. Anybody can do whatever with a lot of money. And the last term was that it should be done with widespread public, par public participation, which nobody really knew what meant, but most people kind of had a, had a feeling that they actually, it, this is kind of democracy working. <laughs> we should have most people on board and do this in kind of a common structure. And then somebody saw this and, and reached out to Samsung and said, should we help you make the master plan, send in the proposal, and which we did, and won the project. So that was, what, that was how we initially started this. It was very much top down and it was a very idealistic and very kind of isolated project we, we, we didn't really see coming. So it was, a, it was a new thing on Samsung. In Denmark, we have, this, we have the folk high schools. We have, we have the, a common structure. We have a very decentralized common structure with the municipalities being quite independent also from many things. And we believe in a, in, a, in a common agreement of things. So widespread public, public participation is kind of the same wording or the same uh, vocabulary of, of, of things. And so we think, we believe that we understand. So, so that is kind of when people agree on things. That is why it's, why it's public participation. You kind of show it, you talk, speak it out in the open and people will reflect on it and we'll have an agreement. So we, 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 we didn't start it ourselves. We, we, we started a lot of other things also, but the initiative comes from various places. So in this case, it came from an engineer who lived on the mainland and he saw this and he was actually an, an engineer in green technologies and green, green development. So he saw this and he, 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 he and his partners in the company, they actually picked three or four islands. So, so each partner made a, a proposal for three or four islands <laughs> to be sure they'd be winning. <laughs> so they, they set it up, kind of the sketch for a master plan to do this. To make it kind of more realistic, they called the local chairman of the trade organization on Samsung, who was a blacksmith or a plumber. He had a, quite a big company for the local scaling. And he was, he, was a, he was a very ambitious businessman. He could see the potential of this also. I mean, there's, there's, there's going to be a lot of construction and a lot of, lot of um, what do you call it, uh, maintenance and, and bis business in general for his company. So he liked the idea also. So he said, yes, we, we need to do that. And, but they both agreed we need to talk to, to uh, democracy also. And so they called the mayor, <laughs> who was a pra pra practitioner of, of, of life. He was, he was a farmer. He was elected mayor because it's a farming community, and he said, we, we need to look into this, mainly because he saw the budget for the whole project and thought, if we'll get 20 or 30 percent in subsidy from the government out of this, that'll, that's a lot of money for, for, for the island, and I'll be a popular mayor. So these three guys, they actually decided to go down and <laughs> see what could be done, and then we won. Yeah, and I think it goes back to the energy thing, too, back in the 70s. That Denmark's reaction to that was very rational and very intelligent and you know, I think you stopped driving on Sundays unless it was an emergency vehicle, that kind of thing. Yeah. Easy, everybody, everybody agrees, everybody does it. But you also remembered that that had happened, whereas I think in places like North America, you know, the moment the oil started to flow again, everybody forgot about it. But you remembered, right, yeah. and you went back to it. So it strikes me that when you're talking about what goes on in SAMHSA, I'm, I'm seeing the same way of looking at things, the same way of, of people getting together and not not working out of their separate silos but saying well we're all citizens of Samso yeah. we're going to figure this out right mm. okay. no that's true I think uh, the reason for, for, for people to do things is, is, is that there's there's a practical reason for doing it so so we need a reason to, to get together and and then this reason has to be kind of it has to demonstrate some some activity otherwise then there's no reason to go to the meeting. So people, people, there's, a, there's an element of what's in it for me in almost everything we do. So, 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 and, the, and these practitioners, they, they, they meet in, 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 in a kind of a, a confident way where they trust each other to be kind of on the same platform. We, we, we do this because it means something for, for where we are from or what, what we aim to, to be at. So I think that, that, is, that, is, that is the practical side of it. The other thing is also that 
community is not community if you don't kind of take care of community development. If, if nothing happens, then it, it is the opposite way. And we had a situation on Samsung where we, in, in the 70s, we already, already then kind of, we, we peaked in the population and we saw also a declining number of people living there because farming got more and more industrialized and, and me uh, mechanical. So we didn't need the hands anymore. So, so it dropped quickly in numbers and, and, and people living on, on the island. That was, a, that, was, that was a bad signal. And people saw that and, and tried to, to do something about it. And in my father's time, he worked very hard to, to keep the slaughterhouse going and to sleep, keep some of the, 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 the other businesses that was on the island going. In his time, they established a new factory uh, where they, they, they did a kind of a cannery factory where they processed uh, vegetables and, and made pickled cucumbers and all kinds of things. And that's still going, this, this company, and, and that is probably one of the biggest companies today on Samsung. So they didn't do it to become rich businessmen, but they did it to, to keep their activities going because they knew if they didn't do that, some of the services they were needing would, would, would stop being there. Because we need a certain, that's a kind of a critical mass that has to be present at all times to, to make a living and to make a society alive. So we were threatened from all sides, from rationalization and from, from the big, big structures on the outside, kind of looking at us and say to them, well, you have a little slaughterhouse there and we have a certain amount of pigs. Why don't we just send them to the mainland and get them butchered at a big slaughterhouse um, over there and a big factory? So we'll close down this one and make a more efficient uh, processing uh, over here on the mainland. And of course, we didn't like that because we were doing a good job. I mean, the butchers there were good uh, people, uh, good edu well educated and... and, 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 and doing a good job, but they didn't care about that. And we knew, of course, that that is, that is a tra tra tradition in, in the more industrialized society, that, that it doesn't take care of the, of the details. It's looking at the wider perspective and at, at end goals, where we're looking much more into the details, where we actually think that this will help us in our own business or in our own life if we help out other structures also. So altogether, we will be society. So when, when these guys, they, they approached us again after like 25 years, I think my father's time, they built the world's, no, the North, Northern European biggest uh, uh, pig farm, which was maybe environmentally not a good idea. But for the slaughterhouse, it was a good idea. And they kept the slaughterhouse alive for almost 25 years. But then they ran out of fuel also, and bigger structures uh, appeared in the horizon, and they took over the slaughterhouse, closed it down, and sent 100 people out of work. So that was actually kind of a big depression, and you can find this everywhere in rural areas. This is happening all over the world, that you see these structures. This is making us very vulnerable, that somebody else outside the community is deciding how this community is going to deliver, uh, deliver its possible ways of, live, of life. So I think, seen from that perspective, we were more than ready to look into something else. So this master plan, or this renewable energy plan, kind of, that was kind of the memory of the 70s and the oil crisis was also a threat from outside. That even bigger structures were threatening, threatening the Danish way of life by kind of opening and shutting the valve of, of floating <laughs> of, of the flow of oil. Uh, so we were just a miniature of the same threat from seen from, from, from our perspective. So this green island project or the, or the climate change program was actually really interesting because this could help us deliver what we needed, uh, maybe in new jobs and a new paradigm and a new thinking of what we're done here, doing here. Of course, Mr. Sven Augen, the, the Minister of Climate and Energy at that time, or the Minister of the Environment, he, he couldn't start this process in all of Denmark in one time. So he, need, he wanted this as, like in the Chinese, let, let, a, let a, a million flowers bloom. <laughs> so he wanted this to be a, a demonstration project that had the value of being possible in many different places at the same time, or one after, after the other. So Denmark would be one big co-op of things that happened uh, simultaneously uh, to kind of cover the, uh, the cl climate change uh, threats and, and, and the, the green tech and the green innovation development. Another thing in this story that strikes me as very Danish and, and very intelligent, for a, particularly for a small country, is to say, okay, our market is too small, for this to work, the slaughterhouse maybe as an example. 
but if we become extremely good at this and extremely competitive at this, then we can export it. And yeah. I sit at home eating cheese from Denmark, right? They make cheese in Canada too, but we don't, I don't think we export it in the way that, that the Danes do. And in this situation, you, then got, you guys then went on to become the world's greatest manufacturers of wind turbines. Yeah. Right? And uh, so it seems to me that seeing in the problem an opportunity is also a, a it just seems to be part of the way that the Danes see the world, you know? Yeah, it, it's maybe a question about, I mean, that's, that's maybe also a question to you. <laughs> it's maybe even a question of where does innovation come from? Uh, does it come from, from kind of um, the big structures, the multinational companies, or, 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 or does it come from politicians and, and visionaries, or does it, does it come from the rural area where you have this little, these little companies that's trying to survive? And they have to be very innovative to survive. They have to find out what, what is the next product we can, we can make a living, living out of. Now, I saw that, I mean, especially wind power in Holland and the Netherlands and in Sweden and also over here in, in, in Nova Scotia, there was actually some wind projects going on. There were some manufacturers of wind projects already in the 70s. And, and, and they were working very hard to, to, to be kind of out there on the market and do things. But for some reason, they disappeared again. And they didn't have this market breakthrough. Maybe because there was, there was too focused to, to gain the market where in Denmark we, we were, we, it was, it was farm, farm machinery manufacturers that actually took over the wind projects. So they were doing irrigation machines and, and trailers and, and, and tractor equipment and all sorts of things. And then they did some wind turbines on the side. Company, companies like Drawing Board? Yeah, Drawing Board, that was one of them. But they didn't, they didn't do so much in the wind, wind turbines. Uh, it, it was... Uh, it was uh, LM fiberglass, it was uh, Vestas. Vestas was a farm manuf manuf manufacturer in the beginning. And LM makes, makes yachts, or did. Yeah, they right? did. Yeah. It was okay. a boat. Yeah. boat and boats. exported them. I've been on oh. them in Canada. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, they made a lot of very beautiful boats. They did. Yeah, but then they knew about fiberglass, so they made the blades, uh, the, the, the wings for, 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 for the wind turbine. So I thought, I, I think, and of course, they were helped by Danish policy also, because we were then looking at how do we, how do we achieve our goals. We need to produce renewable energy. We don't have hydropower. We can't dam our rivers because we don't have any heights in Denmark. So, but we have a lot of wind. We have a lot of biomass. So, so in, in it, from a very early period, we also saw farms. They bought a boiler where they could chug in straw, hay, wood, everything. And they could produce heat for the barns and for the house and for everything. So, so we had some local manufacturers of, of, of wood, wood chip and straw boilers. And they be, then became district heating, decentralized combined heat and power systems. So they also came from local innovation and local production because they were needed. And they could compete with oil prices because we had these oil. I mean, we were helped a lot by raising oil prices. In, the, in 1996, when we started, the oil price on the world market was about $30 per barrel. And 10 years later, it was almost $130 per barrel. Of course, that, we, that was predicted that it would kind of work like this. It's always been doing like, since the 70s, oil prices has gone up like this. They go down a little bit, but then they go up even further. And then, so it's like a staircase of, of price development. Um, and if you can see that, you can also calculate when is a breakthrough economy for, for green technology. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so now we've got a situation. I just want to set that context because I think there are a number of factors in the background that maybe aren't easy to tease out of the story. But yeah. now let's, let's go back to the story. Yeah. So now you've got, you're going to be the renewable energy island yeah. and, and you've got the, the commitment of three guys, <laughs> you know? yeah. but you've got to get the commitment of 4,000. Yeah. And that seems to me to be a fascinating story too. Tell me about the cider press and, and, the, and the role of Tuborg beer in organizing the, the island. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, when we meet for any reason, there's, there's two or three types of meetings. We have the kind of the very, very informal meetings where people are just informed about things. Somebody wants to inform a group of people, a group of citizens in maybe a village or a bigger context, or it can be farmers, farmers that have an organization, they can have a meeting there. You might have a cup of coffee when you leave, but, but there's usually nothing there. Somebody will inform you and then you go home. That's one type of meeting. You have another type of meeting where there will be the, there will be tables. You won't just be seated with chairs. There will be tables with something on the tables, maybe kind of lemonade or, and coffee and some cookies and stuff like that. And then you have the serious meeting that's where you have sandwiches. <laughs> and there will be beer on the table also. <laughs> so this is where the, the famous Carlsberg or Tuborg, they, they, they play a role here. 
because if you see that when you come to the meeting, then you know it's a serious meeting where the, where, where the organizers, they want something out of it. <laughs> they don't treat you beer for nothing. I mean, the, the, they want you to, to, to come up with your opinion about what they are pre presenting. And, and they, of course, this is already, al already prepared during other meetings also. But it kind of meetings develop from being very informal to be more and more formal because at, at, the, at a certain point we need to make decisions. So this is where the widespread public participation w is at work. This is where we actually try to kind of bring in the, the, the public in the decision making. And, and there you, you need a beer every now and again. That, that's <laughs> <laughs> so you went around the island with beer and, and also a cider press, right? Yeah. yeah. Tell me about the cider press, how that worked. Well, the cider press is, um, well, people waste a lot of apples in the, in, in the fall because, I mean, they have a lot of apple trees. From old, day, uh, all, all, from old days, they have apple gardens. Every farm had, had its own apple garden where they collected apples and kept them for the winter. So they had a little stock of apples sitting there until Christmas time or how, how long they could keep them. But, and, but today, people don't really store apples anymore. You buy them in the shop and you buy apple juice in the shop also. So you don't conserve apples as you, like you did in the old days. So these apples just drop on the floor, on the, on the, on the ground, and the birds and prey, uh, wild, wild animals eat them. Which is also good, but people feel a little bit sad about that. So we knew about that. So we bought the apple price and, and went from town to town and said, people, come to the meeting on Saturday. We'll be, we'll be there with the apple price. Bring your containers and your apples and we'll press the apples. And you can go home with, with juice, fresh pressed juice, which is really good. And people enjoy that. And after that, we'll do that from one to three. And three o'clock, we'll have a meeting about this village and maybe potential district heating or wind power projects and other things also. So you can stay or you can go home. That's up to you. <laughs> and of course, people came with wheelbarrows and boxes and buckets uh, with their apples, and we got apple present. There was a good mood there. People had helped each other crush the apples and press them and get the juice out and clean up and get the next one in and all these sort of things. So there was a lot of activity and a lot of good talks there. And I know from my background that you need the good local talk to kind of get in the mood where you exchange info. So how how is it? I saw you got a new car. How is it good? Is, is it running okay? Or somebody will? Oh, your son married the uh, the other day. I mean, is, that was good. A lot of guests showed up, and you had a good party and stuff like that. All these little things you have to talk about that, or maybe it's not little things, but important things for the social life. And before you go to a real meeting, you have to exchange that. That that's a very important part of of of, of the check in for a meeting. And then at three o'clock, most people would stay. Because now, now we're in a good mood and we have talked and we have kind of checked in, so we might as well stay and listen to this guy, even if we're not really interested, but, but the other guys are there. So we, we, we feel comfortable about staying here. So we actually use this. I mean, some might say it's a little manipulative, manipulative or, but, but I think it's just we gave them a good reason to come and they had a product they could go home with the apple juice. So that was a good reason to come there. And then on the site, they could have a little information about potential new energy forms or and stuff like that. I think it was kind of respecting that you need a good reason to go to a meeting. Sure, and something, there's, something of, there's something coming out of it for you, no matter what happens at the meeting itself. Right? We, have, we, we have an old uh, priest in Denmark that was very famous. He formed some of the school reforms in Denmark. He was from 1840s, I think. I can't remember his... His birth, but he was in from that period when we had the ref many of the f reforms in Denmark. We had, we had the the constitution was uh, uh, reformed uh, during that period also. And he was he he'd written a lot of the Danish songs in 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 the, in the kind of the national songbook. And he was he he said a good meeting consists of one part uh, practical information about. Uh, farm things. I mean, it could be a disease for horses, I don't know, some, some thing that would happen with the horse. And another one, the, the, the second part was uh, stories from the, the Nordic mythology and the, the Nordic god, meaning that you had something, you could have a reason to go to the meeting and you were entertained and, and enlightened a little bit about the spiritual side of life as well. And then you could go home. So that was a good reason to bring people together and you had to respect that. Otherwise it would be boring and people would stay home and they would miss this information. Which was, which was good to exchange. So we tried to use that. So now you've got them in the meeting. They're warmed up. <laughs> they're, yeah. they're having a good time. Um, and how do you bring them along to, to because for, uh, I gather, quite a conservative farming community, 
this, was, this is a long jump, isn't it? To say we're going to become the energy efficient animal, we're going to get 100% you know, energy self-sufficiency. Yeah. How do you move them to that? Well, you, you also have to break it up there a little bit. So we didn't move them to the 100% sustainable society. That was kind of too advanced. We always address that. This is part of the, of the master plan. But we are breaking it up now. So for you guys in this meeting house, we might, we, we're talking about maybe a potential wind project. We can have some wind turbines outside. You have a good position for wind turbines. What do you think about that? So we could talk openly about that. Kind of pros and cons and, pros and, cons and, 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 and people could, could bring out their frustrations also. So it's, well, we worry about the, the noise and what about the visual impact of the landscape and what about the birds and what about all these other things. We need to kind of talk about our frustrations before we could go to make, make any kind of decisions. We used to have a people, uh, what do you call them, developers. They market this as a, the best choice of the world and you can't miss it. It's so good and, and it'll save the, uh, the environment for a lot of climate uh, impact uh, things here also. We said the opposite. We said to them, what happens if you don't do anything at all in this community? Well, I mean, wh where are you, where will you be at in the next 10 to 20 years? And people kind of said, realistically, that we would be fewer people will be a, an aging group of people here, we'll have less children, we'll have less job in this area, so we'll be a less, what do you call it, lively community. We will have to more or less close down slowly. We can see this coming. So if there's any potential new jobs, new development, we look into that, that's interesting. Okay, that's a good reason for you to start here. Would you think, would you consider wind turbines as an option? Would you consider district heating as an option for, for you guys to do that? And of course, there was a carpenter, there was a plumber and a blacksmith and other people in the group that could see, yeah, well, if we do that, that is extra work. If we refurbish the houses and put more insulation and improve the houses and give them a new heating system, it's jobs. It's all kind of turnover in, 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 in business uh, perspectives. So they could, they could find their own reasons for this also. The house owner could say, maybe I can save some of, some of the, I think the energy bill or the cost of energy per year is, is, is rising. It's, getting more and more expensive and we're just sending money out of the island to buy expensive oil from outside. If we can change that and make a local development plan here, that makes sense also. So I think what we did was we checked in on the individuals to see then what's in it for you and you and you so people could come up with their own reason to be part of that. And they were very different. Like I said, we had a kind of a common ground with very different reasons to be there. And, and that's community, that's respecting everybody's own opinion or our own, own reason for being there. And you're not selling it. I think this is the this is one of the interesting things. You're selling it in a very pragmatic way, down on the ground. You know this specific house, that particular job, this particular company. Yeah. I mean, you're not saying we're going to change the world here. In fact, when people wanted to say that, you kind of shut them down a little bit, right? I mean, that's if you had your green hippie from Copenhagen, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, that's true. I mean, if we, we, if we got too carried away with it, then we'd very, far, very quickly we'd lose some of the participants in this meeting because they'd probably think, well, if we get on board this uh, voyage here, we'll probably lose control because somebody is really very much ahead of us and we, we're not really up to that. So we needed to, to find out what is the natural pace of development in this particular area. And the hippies, they are, they, they would be all, they, they'd be way ahead of, of development in some aspects. And other aspects, they wouldn't really, if we left it, to, I mean, <laughs> now we're defining hippies and, 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 and locals very different because they, they are very much alike. I mean, they live together and they get along. But, you know, these already convinced people, they sometimes forget about the practical side of it. So they can talk about it for ages and for hours and talk and talk about how we should do this and this and this and, and get in balance with nature and get back to kind of a more sustainable lifestyle. But the real action has to be dealt with in, the, in, a, in a common structure. So we bring as many practitioners in this conversation as possible because they can do the, the, the real change. They are the producers of, of, of what we consume afterwards. Um, so I think that, seen from my perspective, I, I'm a farmer myself. I have a farming background. I'm educated a farmer. I know the, the, the circular economy on a, kind of on a yearly basis. We have to plant something to, to have something in, in, in the fall. Uh, and that's more or less the same thing. We have to plant some ideas to be able to have something later on. And I don't know how long time it does take to grow a wind turbine <laughs> or grow a district heating plant, but, but it takes time. And we need to consider this also in the planning structure.
So okay, so I'm I'm there, and I've, I'm thinking to myself, you know, he's he's right. The, the price of oil is going up, and you know, the the population is going down, and the idea of a wind turbine is a an interesting one, but it's going to cost a lot of money. Yeah. And how does my little village deal with that? That was one of the big issues. Also, I mean, how do we finance the development? Because it, we already kind of we already realizing our situation. We are in a low income area, and and we we're not getting richer. On the, on the contrary, we're actually losing well, the buying capacity because everything else is, is the cost is rising and, and the income is, is lowering in, in, in our areas. So what we did was that we, 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 we made a sketch also where we actually discussed what will be the cost of installing a, a, a permanent system in this area. How much energy do you consume today in total in this village, in this island, in this area? What is the local resources you can buy and what is the cost of that? And then made kind of a, a sketch, an audit, an Excel spreadsheet where we actually did put in all the math and, and, and did, the, did the calculations on, on what, what is the alternative to the existing structure and what is the cost. Then we find out the cost of that. We went to the bank, I said to the bank, bank people on Samsung, we have banks on Samsung. We said to the bank, will you finance this? And firsthand, they kind of didn't really like the idea that we would do the preparation. They'd like to do that themselves, and people could then come and ask for a bank loan to finance the structures. We said to them, man, well, we have to do it the other way around, because how do you feel? I mean, most people feel a little bit bad about going to the bank and ask for a bank loan. That's not nice. <laughs> you only do it if you want, really want to have a new car, or you want to have a new <laughs> kitchen, or extend your house, or whatever you do, uh, have your kids in college, and you, you make huge, big bank loans to do that, because that's your life quality. We need to turn this into life quality and ask people to go to the bank and have a discussion with you about the next paradigm and how they could invest in their house and in their, in their properties and make them more valuable. So seeing it from a kind of real estate perspective and make them aware that if they improve their house and, and make it less con uh, consuming and they conserve energy and they, they imp improve the quality of the house, they can sell it at a higher price. So the real estate price will go up and the, and, and the yearly consumption will go down. And the, and the difference between these two things is maybe making you interested in making a business pro pro proposal for the, for the house owner, which means that you, will, you, you present a, a, bank, a suggestion for a bank loan for, for, for green investments. All right, that's a good idea. Because we, we actually paved the way for a whole new business area for the bank that they could invest, they could help people invest in, in, green, in green development. So people just literally came up and signed a, a document and then they had the money to invest in wind power and house improvement or in district heating or whatever they wanted to get their hands on. So I mean, that, we, 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 we did this kind of little uncomfortable work with the bank <laughs> before, the, before the house owners had to, had to approach the bank and say to them, we're ready now to do the investment. And that was easy. And you know, people like easy. Yeah. <laughs> they, they hate complicated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's interesting too because we're, I'm constantly hearing <coughs> that the environment, you, you can't pay attention to the environment because it's going to hurt the economy, but you've actually created uh, a, another whole, if it may, either a whole economy or a whole layer of the economy mm. that's very profitable for everybody involved and, and didn't exist before. Yes. We realized in 1998 when we started the project, we, we made kind of this balance spreadsheet for the, the, the beginning, I mean, to, to set, set the, 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 the figures right from the beginning. So we were calculating the math on, 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 the, on the real realistic numbers and figures we had there. And we realized we imported for the value about 10 million US dollars worth of energy every year to, to the island. And you know, you had to make a salary, you had to pay your taxes and then buy this expensive oil and gas from outside and bring it to Samsung. That kind of took a huge big hunch of, 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 your, of your buying capacity, of your money. So we said to them, maybe we can change that and then buy the energy. We still would need more or less the same amount of energy, but we could maybe buy it from our own wind turbines or from the next door neighbor, buy his straw to fuel the district heating instead of importing expensive oil. And then keep a, keep a grip on energy development or the price development on, 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 on the, cost of energy, instead of kind of being depending on very fluctuating prices and, and most likely raising prices on, on oil. And, and that proved to be really true, I mean, because oil prices went up like this and we kept a steady pace. We, we actually argued with the farmers, say to them, you can't 
make a rip-off. I mean, you have to be reasonable with your pricing here because you can't sell it outside the island. So we're actually sharing the commons in a way here. You'd make a business out of it and they'll get cheaper energy. So that's kind of a win-win situation. And because we are, we, we are so close neighbors, I mean, one can't utilize the other guys too much. Otherwise, it'll be kind of the talk of the town that this guy, he's too greedy. <laughs> and, and because the big structures, they, you can't do that. Who are you talking to if you talk to the, big, to the big structures? You're not talking to a person, but you're talking to a company or like an institution. And nobody will respond. They just keep on raising the price. Yes. And they'll say, I'd like to help you, but I'm just one guy in a yeah, big institution. Exactly. I can, nothing I can do with it. Yeah. Now, out of all of this, you've come up with a new word. <laughs> Com commodity. Yeah. Tell me about that. I have a very good friend that I became friends with because when we had the climate top meeting in Copenhagen in, in 09, uh, Connie Hedegaard, who was the minister of, of uh, energy at that time in the Danish government, and she, she then became the commissioner of, of climate uh, in, in the European Union. She, she, she invited me and this friend of mine to be part of a, a, an advisory group to help her kind of fill in the gap between policy and industry with the civil society, kind of be the voice of civil society in, in the climate top meeting. So we kind of fed a lot of interesting information to her and we met every now and again and we talked about what is the good idea and where is the kind of the, the vocabulary or the narrative of climate change seen from the civil society's point of view. So we didn't put cost on it or we didn't put policy on it, but we said to them, well, what do we, what do we worry about and what, where, where do we want to be involved in this process? I mean, it's, it's obvious to everybody that the Copenhagen meeting didn't, didn't, didn't end up with a good, good solution. It, did, it wasn't this big contract or the big turnover uh, or turnaround uh, that they expected them to be. But we stayed together after this meeting, he and I. Thor Nørtrand is his, is his name. He's, he's, a, he's a famous writer in, in, in Denmark and he's also published worldwide some of his, some of his books. So he and I, we decided we would like, write to make to, uh, we'd like to write a book about the commons uh, in a modern version, saying that what is the commons of today, trying to understand how we could share the value of the wind, the solar, the biomass, and, 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 and new unknown, I mean to us unknown common structures, trying to discover where are the commons of today. Or has it all we or has it all been privatized and we are in consumers and customers in the shop so, but maybe we could look into that so we decided to write this book and he's 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 a fun guy so in danish the commons is called fellet and fellet fellowship means the the common the community the commons of the community or something like that and and it's spelled with a with a with a with a, in a different way than it is today because then would it it the, the commons was, was administrated by community. So he came up with this idea that we should actually make a new word for that because it's, it's kind of a value, it's a currency. So he said, commons administrated by community must be commodity. <laughs> so the commodity is kind of a, 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 a merging of, of, of the common and community and trying to evaluate the value of the commons in a modern context. It's a fascinating, it's a fascinating term and in a sense, although we haven't sort of thought of it that way, things like the air and the water are the commons, yeah. aren't they? They are the common property of us all. Oh yeah, but... Or but the common support of us all. You say in the structure also, I mean, I'd like to say that the, that the community is, 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 is not a community if there's not a common to share. If you don't have a reason to be community and then you're just individuals, which is maybe the threat of the modern lifestyle today, that everybody is actually more or less isolated as individuals. Which is a pity because we are we are uh, more common in our understanding than we actually believe. I think that's my 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 philosophy, and I think we feel better if we're in a group than if we're individuals. But we we, we are brought up uh, taught to be individuals because we are our own we are our, we create our own destiny in a way, and we can be our own uh, what's called leaders and and be successful uh, if, if we can beat the other guys to the post to the job to the to the money. And, but I think that is kind of so short-sighted in, 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 in the way we organize and structure things. I, I think we feel much better in a group. Maybe this is a little bit out of, out of line here, but you know, the, 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 said, said the, the, the Danes are the most happy people in the, in the world. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I do know that. <laughs> <laughs> Which is kind of, it's kind of ridiculous seen from my point of view, but, 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 but it's, it's, I think it comes from, from, from modern, modern lifestyle uh, analyst 
analytics trying to say that what, what makes a person happy. I think it's much more like the Danes are the most uh, kind of the most trusting people or the most confident people. I'm confident in in my next of kin and I trust him or her to be kind of on the same platform and we work together and it's better than we, that we work together than we competing. We can compete in, in a friendly way saying that I, I do compete with you but I'm also your, 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 your assistant in, in, in some ways because together we'll make more, we'll, we'll be better off and I think it's, it, it winds back to the Vikings. And, and because the whole Viking culture was, was a very independent culture where there was a lot of leaders and a lot of chiefs and, and leaders in all the villages. And we worked together at one stage, the Viking community was actually the biggest nation in, in, in Europe. It, it was Norway, Sweden, England, Northern Germany, Poland, the Baltic area, Finland, all this area was one big, one big nation of a kind. But I, I still wonder how they organized it because they didn't have cell phones, they didn't have telefax, they didn't have anything. How did, they, how did they organize? I think they had a kind of a common understanding where they actually trusted it, each other to be there if there was a need of help and also to be there if there was a need of, of, of prosperity. There's, the, there's, there's indication of, of fleets of 100 boats going from Scandinavia down to the Mediterranean, Mediterranean to to get some wine and women and <laughs> gold and silver and whatever they, they collected. So there's a good reason for them to go down there, and, but, but they, they helped each other. How did they organize 100 boats going all the way down there and go, go back again with what they, the, what they got? It was because they were merchants and they knew what they were looking for. And they were adventurers also, but they came home because they were leaders and they stood up for their own, uh, their own rights in, in, in many ways also. But I think we still do, we have this in, in our genes in a way. I don't know if it's only good, but it but it's certainly is maybe one reason for us to be the most happy people. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's culture, isn't it? It's, it's, it's deep in your bones that you, you, that you like each other, you enjoy each other's company, you work together, you prosper together. That, uh, you know, the, the modern individualism has a big hill to climb in Scandinavia, it seems to me. Yeah? Yeah, but we are still individual. I mean, even on my island, the North Island and the South Island are two different cultures. I mean, we are very alike, but we still speak two different dialects. So there's a different, defined difference between the two, two little, little communities here. And if you go from Copenhagen to the west part of Denmark, there's also significant differences in the culture there. They speak a very, very predominant uh, Jutland dialect over there, and the Copenhagen dialect is, is more like the national radio dialect where it doesn't have any origin, it's kind of, it's a general language there, so they, they, they have, don't have a culture <laughs> when it comes to, to the language, but, but you can define where all the other guys come from. And that's kind of part of this again, so you're from the northern part of Jotland, or you're from one of the islands, or you're from Fyn, or you're from... I think that is kind of this recognition of, of a place, sensing the place and the quality of the place. We also know what they are known for in western Jotland, and the southern part of Jotland, what they are known for, what is their quality, and what they are known for as I mean, in, 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 in the core of their culture, they are known for being, listen, this, having a special sense of humor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. It, uh, I was just thinking, what does hold together that great big Viking uh, community that you, that you mentioned earlier? And I'm thinking this, that there have to be things that, however different the language is, but there are these assumptions about the way you behave together, about yeah. the way you interact together. Mm. And that's better than a cell phone, right? I think so, yeah. You feel that you belong to a place. So this, this connection to, to a place that the belonging to or the sensing the place is important. You return to that same place also. People feel pity uh, about people that, that, doesn't have a, have, that doesn't belong to a place. We, we, we think that is very sad and I think most people do. But we have world, world citizens now that move around all the time and, and they don't belong anywhere. They, 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 they fit in everywhere they are, which is also good that we share everything. So this big global village uh, it, it, it's, it's reality, but it's also kind of maybe the sad side of the story that we don't recognize the sensing of, of the place. We're not responsible there because we're always on the way to, a, to an, uh, another destination. Uh, Karl Marx would call him rootless cosmopolitan. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's right. <laughs> but you're very rooted, you, know, you particularly, but, but, but also people in Denmark, you know, they really know that's where they are and belong and understand and you know yeah it's a really I think it's in, well yeah I think it's very important for the understanding of how the cooperative culture works because we, we have a lot of cooperative organized structures 
the cooperative ownership of wind turbines, the cooperative ownership of many different structures is, is a very dominant uh, cultural structure. So let me come back to the specifics of this of the SAMHSA in the story because uh, what you so where you are at the end of ten years is you not only are you are you hundred percent energy self sufficient not not fossil fuel free yet but but energy self sufficient mm. you're more than that right yeah yes we export a lot of energy because when we made the the, 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 the numbers we, we calculated the numbers we said. We can, we can cover the, the, the heat demand with local resources. We can cover the electricity demand with onshore wind turbines. But transportation is still a, a, a tough nut to crack because we haven't got the, uh, the, the technology there, there yet. And, and in, in, my, in my opening, I, I was talking about uh, uh, it, it had to be based on proven technology. And, and we don't have electric cars that is really proven yet. They do exist. And, for some reason we have, well, that's maybe for, for good reason, we have the highest percentage of electric cars per capita on SAMHSA already. So, 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 so they are there and, and we try to develop it as fast as possible, but it's still kind of, it's too expensive. The range, the driving range is not long enough and there's, there's many, many things that need to be improved still. So we decided to make uh, 10 offshore wind turbines to, to offset this carbon emission from, from, uh, from transportation. So that's why, why we are exporting about almost 80,000 megawatt hours per year is exported to the mainland from the offshore wind turbines, which is more or less the same figure that we use for transportation. Mm -hmm. so you wind up actually producing about 10% more than you need. Yeah, that right? that's yeah. right. Yeah, which is a, a pretty remarkable achievement. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, so how, are, how, will, how do you see the transportation issue resolving itself? Uh, <clears throat> I think I think we've taken away some of it by producing a lot of goods on the island, but we're still exporting a lot of vegetables and other things also. So we need transportation. I think some some things is, is happening happening already. We have bought a new ferry that'll be running on LNG, which is liquid li liquid nat natural gas. That, that's still fossil fuel, but that opens the possibility of we can make a biogas digester and use our excess, our waste products, our farm waste and all the organic matter, we can digest that and produce methane and upgrade the methane to LNG, LNG quality and, and fuel our own ferry. Because we can't, the LNG production is too expensive today, so that's not feasible for us to make L a, a, a methane gas uh, production from local waste products. So that's why we haven't done it. We tried a couple of times, but we can't really make the, the, the numbers right. But now we can because we 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 with the the competitive price is the 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 the, the market price of LNG. So we are now in a position where we'll reopen this project and and start producing our own uh, methane gas. So 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 that will also open the way for buses and trucks and and other other vehicles that can be d driven on local produced gas. Even cars. Yeah. yeah. And then you've got the surplus of electricity that you can. Yeah, we can. We hope that uh, that that uh, the, the development of, of batteries will be, will, will be there in, in, a, in a near future. So we can use the battery as storage also, so we can actually charge the, 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 the cars when there's wind and drive them when there's no wind. <laughs> well, I was going to ask you how you deal with the intermittency of the wind power, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. We, we, have, we are grid connected to the mainland, so, so we are part of the big system. So that's not only Denmark, that's also Scandinavia and Germany. So, so we're part of a very big structure where we have hydro dams in, in Norway and Sweden and we have solar panel in German. We have many things, many, many different decentralized structures that feed into the same system. And then we still have some backup capacity from the old power plants that is, that is in operation. So all in all, we have a lot of, 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 of production units that is feeding into the same system. And we can actually control that in a, in a smarter way than we could in the old days. Computers has done a lot of change to that, so we can actually navigate in, 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 even if we have a wind passing by Denmark, we can see that the wind turbines build up production on the west coast and then it kind of moves all the way across Denmark. We can administrate that and still have a very reliable electricity system. Now, isn't Denmark working on, in fact, haven't you tried out someplace, the idea of using car batteries as mass storage so yeah. that you've got a, a smart grid that that's okay when you've got lots of wind, you're, you're charging everybody's batteries, yeah. <laughs> and then, but then you buy it back at times yeah. when there's no wind. Is that's that, right. yeah? Well, it's been tried and tested, but it, it, we, we, we're not there yet because it, but when, when, you, when you take the electricity from the grid and put it into a battery, then it works that way because the batteries are, are made for charging. 
But when you take it out of the batteries again, you have to go to do a different process because it's not got the same hertz and voltage. So you need to kind of re restructure that via some some inverters that can do that, and that's not really operational yet. So it's a more complicated process to get it out of the batteries and back into the system again. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> so that always sounded to me like that was very promising. Oh wow, that, that, that's a, that could be very interesting. Got a lot of battery capacity out there, but it's all spread out and you know. That's a, that's, a dream, stars, that's, right? that's a dream scenario. Yeah, it is. <laughs> oh, you want that to happen, yeah. <laughs> it absolutely is. What is it, uh, what has this whole process done in terms of out-migration? Because I know you were, you were very concerned, as, as you mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. about the decline of population. Has this tended to arrest that? Well, when, when, the, f when the slaughterhouse finally closed in 96, 97, we, we sent 100 people out of work. And most of them would have moved away from the island because they couldn't live without a job. I think we, we employed 30, 40 percent uh, of them again right away when we started this transition to green energy because we need a lot of more carpenters, plumbers and installers and maintenance people to, to do the job here. Uh, so so, so we, we kept people. I mean, we didn't, maybe st we didn't really stop the mi migration, but we stopped the, the disaster development we could foresee because of this. And I think right now we've more or less stopped the the, the the, the, the pattern of, of people moving away from the island, but we have still have a high, high death rate, not high, but, but because the aging population and a lower birth rate, because elderly people, they don't get so many, <laughs> they don't have so many babies. <laughs> but we, we see that we don't have, a, we, we have more, more new families moving to Samsu than from Samsu. So we actually have a good situation here in the, in the, in the mid, mid section of 20 to 50 years. We have a growing number of these guys, but we have a, we have an even higher number of of the, of the elder people because people retire and move to Samsu because it's a lovely place to, to stay, and then the younger generation from 15 to 20, 25 they move away from the island to be educated, and they 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 most likely not come back. So it, the, the the what do you call it the pyramid of 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 of, of civilization there is not really good. I was going to ask you if the if the if the young family is moving in. Where Samso people moving home, because we certainly see that in Nova Scotia. The Nova yeah. Scotians go out west, and but eventually, you know, a great number of them say, "I never wanted to leave, and yeah. I always wanted to live back in Nova Scotia." And they'll yeah. come back in in their later years. We have a lot of local people that wants to stay on Samso and come back, and and some people do also. And the people who come from outside who doesn't come from Samso, some of them come over and they're very excited about living on Samso, but after a while they they realize that their families and relatives they are not there. So they, they, I'd say half of them will move back again after some years on Samsung. But, but I think we have a new, kind of a new, a new situation. Uh, we established the Energy Academy in 2007, and we now we have now 12 permanent staffs, which, which is 12 per persons who also have a partner, like a husband or a wife, and some kids and stuff like that. So that's good. Um, and we have five, six thousand visitors per year visiting the Energy Island uh, and the Energy Academy. And they come over and they spend time in hotels and restaurants and they keep people busy also um, uh, in the springtime and in the autumn time. So we, we are creating kind of unexpected side effects of, 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 of the energy project, uh, which is kind of in a more uh, informal way, uh, also, also profiting the, the, the development of the island. Mm -hmm. and in, a, in a curious way, you're exporting knowledge, right? I mean, yes. you're bringing people in, but you're actually exporting the knowledge, right? Yeah, that was actually the intention. The minister, he, he wanted Samsu to be this model. He wanted the, this to be the proof of what he promised at the Kyoto conference, that we can do that in demo. We can make this frog leap in, in innovation and, and, and make little communities actually uh, overcome the, 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 what do you call it, the challenges of, of making big change. And then we proved that. And we have a lot of visitors from all over the world that come to Samsu and stay for a while. Uh, and study what we're doing here. And, and they are not studying wind, wind turbines or technology, they're studying the social impact of this and the social response to, to change. And how did that happen and how did you meet and how did you convince people to, to, to get on board this project? Same questions I've been asking. Yeah, right? no, that's a question we get all the time. That's, <laughs> yeah. yeah. One of the things that strikes me about this too is once you've got all this in place, you've created a kind of a stability in the local economy mm. that, that, that can't be replicated by if you're really meshed into the larger economy. I mean, if you're really reliant on, on, on the fossil fuels from outside, you're going to have recessions and depressions and expansions that you have no control over. But here, yeah. 
the steady supply of energy is a steady supply of jobs and activity and so on, right? That, that's, a, that's the whole intention of, of decentralized decision making. Because if, if, you, if you decide to, to be your own boss in a way, you're, you're also kind of deciding what is going to be the, the, the paradigm of the next uh, development. If you are not your own boss, if you're just end consumer and, and, and you rely on somebody else to supply you, then you don't have a saying and you're depending on these, uh, these diff different, different situations and you have, to, you have to adapt to that. And we can't afford that. But that is, that is way too dangerous for a little community and that kind of give, leaves us in a, in, in a kind of a de depression because we can't follow these changes. So, so being independent in, in energy is, is, is really crucial to, to local development and the perspective of being kind of self-governant uh, in, 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 in many aspects. What's next? Well, do you mean for me or for the project? Uh, actually both. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we have a 2.0 plan where we, it, we have agreed with the local municipality has, has signed this contract also. It is to be fossil free by 2030, which is maybe way ahead of us. But, but the Danish government has decided that Denmark will be uh, independent from fossil f uh, fuels in 2050. So we said to the government, well, maybe we'll demonstrate that we can, how we can do that, but much, fa much faster than this because we already kind of underways with the, with, the, with the plan. <clears throat> and they accepted that and gave us a little fund to, to work out uh, that new plan, this fossil free 2.0 plan. So this is what we're working for now to, to pave the way for that to happen. Um, and I think the Energy Academy is, is now kind of teaming up with the universities and research institutes to, to help us do that because that is a little bit different from the previous project where we use proven technology and stuff that was already there. Here we want to go a little bit further and try out things that has not been tested so seriously. And, and maybe that is kind of, it's, it's not going to be easier. It's probably going to be more complicated. But, but anyways, I, I think it's a very important role we are taking on there. I suspect it's going to be a lot of fun. It's, it's always fun to do things like this. It's also very, I mean, where there's problems, there's also pos possible adventures. I think the adventure side of this is that you need to call in people that you really want to work with. And, and the, the good thing for me now is that I, I have the capacity now to call people and ask them to come help me. And, and they come. Partly because they, they, I, I, I have a relation with them, but partly also because they, they know it's a good project and they can kind of mirror themselves in, in, in the SAMHSA project and kind of be part of a process they can kind of put on their CV, <laughs> which is important. That, that we are not just a little kind of sorry to be place uh, where people kind of feel pity about the, the people who are there now. We play a certain role and we have a name that is kind of enough quality for people to, to wish to be part of it. So that's a whole different situation. Yes. People on the island feel very proud of that, I would guess. Oh, yeah. Well, that's very funny. I mean, if, if you're a journalist, we have had different journalists. If you look at our website, you can find a lot of articles written about the SAMHSA project. In the beginning, there's a lot of critical people also on SAMHSA. And we asked them, do you think this is good for the island? Uh, it's most likely going to be very expensive and it's going to be problematic and blah, blah, all these sort of things. If you ask the same, some of the same people today, they say, well, green energy has been good for some, so it's, um, and, and, and it's provided uh, new jobs, and so it, 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 was, it was a wise decision to be part of that. <laughs> <laughs> In we, retrospect, I yeah, feel smart. <laughs> it, it's always, it was always easier to see what, what history brought, brought us uh, and, and, and evaluate that see, looking backwards. So we'll, ha we'll, we'll foresee the same critical uh, voices also from the society when we, we get on with the new projects. They'll probably say to them, oh, that's not going to work, it's going to be too expensive and complicated and we can't do that, we're just a little community, and blah, blah. The same things again. But that's a challenge we need to overcome and we have to study how do we do that? And on, what is the next blacksmith or the next um, practitioner that will show up and be the change maker of this society? And we need to find other ways of finding these guys. How do we identify them? Maybe the, the Apple press <laughs> is not enough, but we, we need to, to do something else here. But it's a brilliant device. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah well, no, we'll keep it. We'll, yeah, it. we'll keep wonderful. it and see if it works again. But, yeah. but, but maybe we need to, to use other things also. So we're working, the Energy Academy is trying to develop a, kind of a campus where we'll invite people to come and stay. So like universities and science and research institutes, we like to, them to come and stay for a while. 
and be part of the community so they'll go out with the Apple Press and be there at the meetings. So when people ask questions, we'll have these science people and the research people and they can set them and say, we have some promising results here. We, we, we think it'll work. <laughs> and we will certainly help you make it work. Because we, that's where the confidence is again. We need to trust somebody to help us in, 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 a, in an honest way. Not some salesman from a company that sells us some, some technical wonder tools that eventually show, shows, uh, I mean, doesn't work. And we don't want to lose, we want to win. Absolutely. Yeah. I uh, thank you so much for this. I, I, just before we, we, we end, I wanted to uh, share with you something I noticed when I was looking on the web for Soren Hermansen. Yeah. Over and over again, it says he's an energy mus magician. Uh, right. right? <laughs> but on reading what I reading it and on talking to you, I don't think you're an energy magician. I think you're a people magician. I mean, that's <laughs> really uh, the <laughs> energy stuff much. flows from that. But that's what I think. And I'm so glad we've had this conversation. Thank you. It was good to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me. Soren Hermansen, who organized the little Danish island of Samsø to lead the world in energy independence. If you enjoyed this interview, you may want to take a look at our interview with Hugo Spowers, who is reinventing the auto industry, or Mark Boyle, who's rejected the use of money, or Mohammed Hage, who's created the world's first commercial rooftop farm. For The Green Interview, I'm Silver Donald Cameron. See you next time.